for my yoke is easy and my burden is light as compared to what? Now there's the question. There's only two masters. Jesus said, you're with me or you're against me. It's my yoke or the devil's yoke. It's my service or his service. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way. You've heard that before? And few there be that find it. It's not that it can't be found, but for some reason a lot of us sort of think in a herd mentality. And we just go down the broad road with everybody else. Is it easier to be saved or lost? Well, first I want to make it clear that good and bad comes to everybody in life. Uh, there are struggles for everybody. We're not talking about is life hard or easy because life is difficult and there are problems. Now Jesus said, Matthew 5, verse 45, he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good. He sends the rain on the just and the unjust. Job, when trials came into his life and he was a perfect and upright man, it says, shall we indeed accept good from the Lord and shall we not accept adversity? You will have good and you will have adversity in your life. Everybody's going to have some trials. But people are wondering, is it easier to be saved or lost? And a lot of folks get discouraged. They think, I'd like to be a Christian, but it's so hard. There are trials, there are struggles that come. Acts 14, 22, Paul said, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. You notice, and this today is not popular because the the church at large, many evangelical churches teach that God loves us too much to allow us to suffer tribulation, that if you have faith, you're going to be healthy and you're going to be wealthy and you're going to be wise and you won't have any problems, and if you do, you just don't have enough faith. And because the Lord loves us, the great tribulation the Bible talks about, we won't experience that. We will all be caught up. If you don't have faith, you're left behind. We'll be caught up before the tribulation. Because that's not what the Bible teaches. God doesn't say he saves us from tribulation. Do you notice what Paul said? It is through. Now that's the difference, being saved from it and being saved through it. Was Noah saved from the flood or through the flood? Was Daniel saved from the lion's den or through it? How about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Did God, because he loved them, save them from the furnace? He went through the furnace with him. God said, when you pass through the fires, when you go through the waters, I will go with you. But he doesn't promise that he's going to save us from trouble. Paul said, it is through tribulation we enter the kingdom of God. Jesus said, he that endures to the end will be saved. Christ said, Mark 13, 13, you'll be hated by all for my name's sake, but he that endures to the end shall be saved. There is endurance that is involved. And John 16, 33, these things I've spoken to you that you might have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And so the Lord is making very clear that believers will have tribulation, but cheer up. Unbelievers have tribulation too. Life is tough. How many of you have had trials in your life? <laughs> Anyone trial free? Now when I look at the trials some people go through, I think I don't have any problems. You know, after I come back from one of these trips to India, or Africa and you see the shanties and the people sleeping on the street and just living from hand to mouth and I, then I think about you know how a flat tire ruins my day and in perspective I think wow it's really not that bad and someone says oh I had trials this week I had a flat tire did you have a spare yeah but I had to change my tire <laughs> and so you know in our way of thinking those are trials uh, we, most of us don't have, but some of us have more serious trials. If we've got a terminal disease or someone we love has a terminal disease or we're going through terrible health problems or you may have tremendous financial reverses and struggles and stress and someone you love is lost. There's all kinds of trials. But if you live long enough, you're going to have problems. So the question is not, do the saved have problems and the lost don't? Or do the lost have problems and the saved don't? 
Everybody's got problems. But is it easier to be saved than lost? Is it easier to win or to lose? Well, how many of you like losing? Jesus asks this question, Matthew 16, 26. What profit is it if a man gains his whole world, the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? I remember reading back during the stock market crash in, what was it, 1928? Some people over 29, they overnight lost their fortunes and it was, I guess, fairly common day after day people were, these people who had great wealth lost it all and they were jumping from the windows because they thought that it all, because they lost the earthly treasure, they lost everything and they killed themselves, believing their lives had no meaning. There was a, um, a man in the news, a very wealthy man in charge of an energy company that was indicted and uh, the day after the indictment, he drove his car, he was by himself, very quickly into a concrete embutment. And at first they couldn't say what it was, but they suspect it was suicide. He was waiting to turn himself over to the authorities and to be imprisoned. And he despaired of life. He had lived as a very successful, very popular, very famous, wealthy man, killed himself. So losing can be hard. Some people take it pretty hard. Matthew 13, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, and when he has found one pearl a great price, he goes and sells all that he has to get it, because that's profitable. Willing to sacrifice everything for that which lasts forever. Now probably one of the best analogies if you're trying to decide is it easier to be saved or lost is from the story of Israel and the Exodus. My question would be, is it easier to be a slave or to be free? And people would say, well, of course it's easier to be free. Is it? Do you know how you get freedom? Does freedom ever come easy? Do you know why we have what freedom we have left? Because a lot of people died for it. And they spilt their blood and they sacrificed their lives. So yes, we want to be free, but freedom costs a lot. And as we are willing to sacrifice our freedoms one by one, I think we forget what slavery is. There's a whole nation of slaves called the Israelites. And after being saved from their slavery, they forgot how hard it was and they wanted to go back to Egypt. It's amazing. Oh man, this going through the wilderness with God is tough. I wish I was back in Egypt. And they forgot back in Egypt, they're serving a king that hates them. They're working for his glory. They're not getting paid. Listen to how Moses describes it. Deuteronomy 26, verse 6. But the Egyptians mistreated us, afflicted us, and laid hard bondage on us. Then we cried to the Lord God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and looked upon our affliction, our labor, our oppression. So the Lord brought us up out of Egypt with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, with great terror and signs and wonders and power of God. And he's brought us to this place and given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So which is easier, being a slave of the Pharaoh or being a servant of God? Wouldn't you think, I mean, if you could look at the two options, wouldn't you think it'd be easier, well, I'm going to the promised land. But why did they keep wanting to go back? They said, going through the wilderness is hard. They had hope. God fed them from heaven. They got hungry before they cried for bread. He gave them water out of a rock. They got thirsty before they got the water. They were attacked by their enemies. He gave them victory over their enemies, the Amalekites. So they did have struggles in the wilderness, but they won in every case God took care of them. And they were on their way to a land that was theirs, to freedom. But in the transition, it was hard. Is it harder to be enslaved to the devil or to serve Jesus? I'd like to tell you that the Bible, I think, is pretty clear it is much harder, at least from my perspective, to be a slave to the devil than to be a servant of God. I've spent years enslaved 
people are enslaved by their habits and their addictions and their problems and then when you're finally set free I know a man attends here every now and then alcoholic for years and oh it must be 25 years ago God gave him victory over alcohol but he struggled with that slavery for so long that he can't stop praising Jesus for setting him free you talk to him even though it's been years because he hasn't forgotten what it was like if you know what slavery is there's no question it's easier to fight for your freedom and there might be a fight but it's worth it as opposed to being a slave now that applies to patriotism as well as Christianity Jesus said and this was our memory verse our scripture reading Matthew 11 28 come to me all you who are heavy laden and I will give you rest as opposed to the serving the Pharaoh with rigor take my yoke upon you Jesus doesn't say there's no service involved a yoke is an instrument of burden take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light as compared to what? now there's the question Jesus says my yoke is easy my burden is light his yoke compared to who, whose yoke? there's only two masters Jesus said you're with me or you're against me it's my yoke or the devil's yoke it's my service or his service and Jesus tells us my yoke is easy as compared to his he didn't say there aren't trials it is easy compared to the devil my burden is light compared to the devil and it's either going to be one or the other Proverbs 13 15 good understanding gains favor but the way of the transgressor is hard is it easier to be saved or to be lost the way of the transgressor is hard and they may not know it right away because there are pleasures of sin for a season but you stay in the way of the transgressor and it's going to be tough the way is hard Ecclesiastes 8.12 now this is Solomon's observation also though a sinner does evil a hundred times and his days are prolonged well he's been sinning nothing bad happened look like things are going okay I mean they ask this question in the book of Job and Job says haven't you ever noticed that sometimes you'll see sinners and it looks like their kids are healthy and their flocks are, are breeding and their crops are, are full and it seems like everything's fine and they're prospering but it doesn't stay that way though a sinner does evil a hundred times and his days are prolonged yet I surely know it will be well with those who fear God who fear before him it will not be well with the wicked nor will he prolong his days which are a shadow because he does not fear before God you know in the end of Ecclesiastes he says let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of of man for God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing whether it be good or evil he said in the end you're going to be better if you fear God and keep his commandments alright is it easier to be rich than poor now don't misunderstand this this is not really a statement on prosperity but I just want to give you an illustration some people think if you can choose between being rich and being poor you think oh man I'd much rather have money I think most of us would say that but is that where happiness comes from notice Mark 10 27 Mark 10 20 through 27 this rich young ruler comes to Jesus he falls down on his knees he says Lord what must I do to have eternal life and Jesus said why do you call me good there's no one good but one and that's God but if you would enter into life keep the commandments he says which ones and Jesus begins to recite the ten commandments that apply between man's relationship with his fellow man so teacher I've kept all these from my youth and Jesus looked in, looking at him loved him and he said one thing you lack go your way sell whatever you have give it to the poor you will have treasure in heaven you want treasure you'll have it you'll have treasure that thieves can't steal you'll have treasure that will last forever unload take up your cross and follow me he was inviting him to be an apostle like Peter and James and John forsook their nets and followed him Matthew forsook his cash register and followed Jesus he says to this young man who he loved you got a lot of potential but you're going to have to liquidate if you're going to follow me because your riches are going to be a distraction but he was sad 
at this word and he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Now here's the question. When he went away did he still have great possessions? But was he happy? He was sad. He was sorrowful. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. See one reason it's hard for us to be saved or it seems like it is because we're trying to save the wrong thing. We're thinking our treasures are down here. We're not calculating the treasure that lasts forever. Jesus looked around and he said to the disciples how hard it is. Notice who's having a hard time. <laughs> it's the rich. How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. And Jesus answered and said to them again, just in case you misunderstand, children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier. Notice the words hard and easier. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And they were astonished, said, who then can be saved? And he said, well, with man it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. Now riches are not a curse in and of themselves. Proverbs has some both sides of the, the equation here. It says in Proverbs 10.22, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and he adds no sorrow with it. In the blessing of God you can have riches as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Job. And you can be blessed. Proverbs 11.28, he who trusts in his riches will fall. There is one who makes himself rich and yet he has nothing and there's one who makes himself poor and yet has great riches. This rich young ruler, if he had made himself poor for Christ he would have had great riches. But instead he held on to his earthly riches and he made himself poor and he was sad. And then Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 5, the abundance of the rich will not permit him to sleep. So here you got a man who's sad and he can't sleep. Why? He's worried about his stuff. If you don't have anything, you can sleep like a baby because you don't have to worry about thief breaking in. He has nothing to steal. We used to sing a song when I was a hippie. Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. <laughs> and Chris Christopherson told the truth there. You don't have much, and I've been there before. You don't worry about will they steal my stuff because you don't have anything. There's a peace there. So who has peace? Isaiah 48, 22. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. I saw a bumper sticker one time, and it said, N-O, God, N-O, peace. No God, no peace. And then underneath it it said, K-N-O-W, God, K-N-O-W, peace. If you have no God, you have no peace. But if you know God, you will know or experience peace. There is no peace to the wicked. Isaiah 57, 18 I have seen his ways and I'll heal him. I'll lead him. I'll restore comforts to him and to his mourners. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him who is afar off and to him who is near, says the Lord. I will heal him. But the wicked are like the troubled sea. It cannot rest. Whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. So you got it at least twice there. You remember when Paul was running from God? He's fighting Christians. He's fighting his conscience, really. Finally, Jesus appears to him. You remember what Jesus said to Paul? He said, I'm Jesus who you're persecuting. Is it hard for you to kick against the goads? You know, you probably don't see it very much. It's more common in other countries that when their poor people are kind of moving their ox and their cattle along, they'll have a sharp prod. It might have one or two prongs on the end of it. And now they use electric hot shots to move the cows. And they jump pretty good when you touch them but they had these poking sticks and sometimes the horse or the cow or whatever it was would kick against the prod and they would just cut themselves because it was sharp and if they would just go the way that the owner was directing them it would be easy but they're kicking against the goads I think it says King James kicking against the pricks and this is what Paul was doing is he was fighting God and Jesus said how's it going Paul? He was miserable he said isn't it hard Jesus, isn't it hard fighting your conscience and fighting the Lord and serving the devil? And finally Paul surrendered and when he fell in love with Jesus, well, the world was never the same. 
He said, woe unto me if I preach not Christ. There's no peace for the wicked. Now there are battles in life and sometimes we struggle. And look at the terminology that is used. Ephesians 6.12 For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers, the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. There are titanic battles with the devil that you're going to fight. The Bible says we need to put on armor. When do you put on armor? Because there's a war. 1 Corinthians 9.26 Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body to bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others I myself should be disqualified or be a castaway. Paul said there are struggles, there's effort involved, there's no question. Here's some of the words that are used. We war, wrestle, fight, run, strive, press on, labor, those who say, you know, they preach a Christianity where there's no effort involved, they're lying to people. But you know what? It's tough to be a real Christian. It's a lot tougher to be lost. And sometimes it is so hard to hold on. We feel like in our own strength we just can't do it. I remember when I was very young, uh, my father taught me to water ski. And... Um, right out of our back door my dad had a home on the bay Biscayne Bay we had a ski boat and he took me out I was like eight years old and I remember he'd take us skiing early in the morning the water was like glass before we went to school he'd wake us up I hated it he'd wake us up it was extra early come on we're gonna go skiing he'd take us out the water was all glassy it was before he went to work before we went to school and uh, I remember he was trying to teach me to ski and and I'd see my brothers get up they were all older and they'd ski two skis and my father put me in the water and he put the life belt on me. It was just a belt back then. They didn't have the whole vest thing. And he said, put your knees up, aim your ski tips up, put the rope in. And he said, now hang on. He thought, well, I'm, the rope's going to pop out of my hands when he tries to pull me up. He said, don't let go, hang on. That was the last thing he said, now hang on. So as soon as I started going up, my skis parted like that. <laughs> and I went forward. But I hung on. And I, got, I can hold my breath pretty well. And my father had gunned the boat, and he told my brother to watch me. Now, my brother's the spotter. My brother didn't say anything to my father about Doug's down. He thought this would be interesting. So he's just watching, and I'm holding on. My dad is going like you would go when you're pulling a skier. And I, I guess I have a pretty good grip because I held on, and it was going faster and faster, and all these bubbles and roars going by me, and water is going in my ears and up my nose and around behind my eyeballs. And I'm trying to hang on. I was doing, I was like a torpedo. <laughs> I'm going underneath the water and up above the water. And finally, when I realized my bathing suit was around my knees, <laughs> I let go of the rope. <laughs> I couldn't hold on anymore. My knuckles were so sore. And, uh, but you know, when the Lord is telling us to hold on, it's different than you holding on with your strength. He is holding on to you. You can read about this here. Can we trust Jesus? John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. John 6, 39. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me I should lose nothing. He'll hang on to you. But I'll raise him up the last day. Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good, good work in you will complete it, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher. Notice the words of completion there. He will complete it. He's the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Would you let go of something you paid so much you gave your life to save? God is going to do everything he can do to hang on to you. He's on your side if you're willing to be willing. And if you just come to the Lord, and if you fall, you tell him. Say, Lord, I've given you my life. Do whatever you've got to do to change me. He will work in your life. He works out your salvation. 2 Timothy 1.12, For this is the reason I suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed for I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he is able 
to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Do you believe that if you commit your life to Jesus, he is able to save you? Would he give all that he gave for you to be saved if it wasn't possible for you to be saved? Of course it is, friends. Don't let the devil make you think the Christian life is a hard life. Serving him is the hard life. Serving Jesus, he says, my burden is easy, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Do you believe that? Hello friends, this is Pastor Doug Batchelor, and I want to thank you for watching Amazing Facts Presents Australia. I remember meeting someone that told me, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm just not a practicing Christian. And of course, what they were talking about is they had accepted Christ earlier in their life, and they figured once you're saved, you can't be lost, it doesn't really matter if you're practicing the teachings of Christ or following Jesus. Does the Bible really teach that? How much of a choice do we have, and what is meant by predestination? All of these very important issues are answered in this special book. We'd like to send it to your friends for free. To get your free copy, text your name, address, and requested free offer details to 0458-222-444 or visit amazingfacts.com.au. And you can email us at freegifts at amazingfacts.com.au. Thank you so much for watching Amazing Facts Presents today. And remember, God's message is our mission. I began reading the Bible. I got baptized into seventh day. I realized that there had to be more to life. God is really doing this. The life that He's given. This message was so powerful. Christ, wherever He goes. Amazing facts. More than 45 years of proclaiming God's message around the world. And then the logo pops across, Amazing Facts Presents. I've listened to a lot of different ministers, but he was, this was the first time that he's actually saying something where I had to grab my Bible and actually pick it up. And I've never heard this before. Let me, let me look through and find this. And I just couldn't get enough. And so I started doing Bible studies. Every single one of these guys started being changed, including myself. My question was, why did that happen to me, God? The Lord was able to reach out, and I actually saw him as a father. I lost everything, and that was when I realized that it was God missing in my life. I went to a prophecy seminar, which knocked me out. This message was so powerful and so irrefutable. I just went, this is real. This is, this is amazing.